take your Bibles and turn to to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We will pick up one verse. From 9. Warnings from the Wilderness. In his book uh, called Fuzzy Memories, Jack Handy writes this. He says, there used to be a bully who would demand my lunch money every day. And since I was smaller, I'd give it to him. And then I decided to fight back. I started taking karate lessons. But then the karate lesson guy said I had to start paying him $5 a lesson. So then I just went back to paying the bully. (laughs) I thought that was a funny story. Too many people feel it's easier to pay the bully than to learn how to defeat him. Except the bully called sin will eventually stop beating you up and one day will destroy you. The Associated Press ran this article several years ago. It said this, for eight years, Sally had been the Romero family pet. When they got her, she was only one foot long, but Sally grew until eventually she reached 11 and a half feet and weighed 80 pounds. On July 20th, 1993, Sally, a Burmese python, turned on their 15-year-old son, Derek, strangling the teenager until he died of suffocation. The police were quoted as saying that the snake was quite aggressive, hissing and reacting when they arrived uh, to investigate One has said about that story, sins may seem harmless, but eventually they will grow to destroy you. One final story that I'll use by way of introducing our subject this morning, another true story. Uh, This uh, author says this, uh, raccoons go through a glandular change about 24 months, after about 24 months of life. After that, they often attack their owner. Since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog and a scrap, a zookeeper felt compelled to mention the change coming to a pet raccoon owned by a young lady named Julie. She listened politely as she explained, as he explained the coming danger, and he never forgot her response. It will be different for me. And she also smiled as she added, Bandit wouldn't hurt me. He just... He just wouldn't. Well, Julie underwent plastic surgery just three months later for facial lacerations sustained when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. Gary Richmond, who wrote this in his book, Views from the View from the Zoo, said this, All too often, sin comes dressed in adorable disguise. And so we play with it. How quickly we find ourselves saying, it will be different for me. However, he says, the results are predictable. So my aim uh, this morning from the passage we're just about to read is to cause you to take a long look at not only your outward actions of your life, but also the condition of your heart and the attitudes in your life so that one day you won't find yourself caught in, in deep sin and incur the, the discipline of God in your life. And we need to understand that if not kept in check, your heart will lead you to places that will only get you in trouble. Along with that, I want you to learn from, from your own past failures, but according to this passage, especially the failures um, of others. So without further ado, let's read this passage together. And if you If you're feeling healthy enough, would you please stand for the honoring of God's word? And this is what Paul says in his uh, his, uh, letter to uh, the church at Corinth. We're going to pick it up in verse um, verse 26 and 27. I know you got 27, but I'll read 26 first. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, verse 27, 
But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He uses a word called a dokamos. It could be a cast rejected, cast aside. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Now that's probably a verse you've heard before, right? Someone said that to you. And then verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And I know this passage sounded probably for the longest part of it like a Debbie Downer. And there are some very difficult parts we're going to look at. But the last two verses are so encouraging and so inspiring. And I hope they will uh, bring encouragement uh, to your life. Let's, um, Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, you are good and you do all things well. Your word is true and through it, Father, you will change our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Father, would you open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So here's what you need to know, and I know you all know this, that the scriptures are inerrant, they are inspired by God, they are uh, uh, spoken uh, from the Father through the Holy Spirit to authors, and it is inerrant, without error, (laughs) inspired, everything written is. But you know what's not inspired? Are chapter breaks. (laughs) The chapter breaks are just some, some, uh, some, some good people at one time just t- took a letter and said, this would be a good place for a break and put chapters. So uh, when, when the book was written, when, when God uh, inspired the Bible, it was inspired without chapter breaks. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, and the reason I say that is because we're not going to start... Uh, at chapter 10, verse 1, because I, I think that 927 is a, a holdover. It's a, an important concept that we really need to understand. Paul says this. He, he tells them in 26 and 27, I don't just run aimlessly. I don't box as one just beating the air. Hey, where is, where is he? He says, I don't do that. But, uh, but instead, I, I'm, very, I, I'm, I'm not willy-nilly half-hearted, not sure what's going on. I'm very careful about this. And I, I discipline my body. Or some versions would say, I buffet my body, right? I beat my body would be another word some versions would use. I discipline my body. And he's, he's got this thought of a boxer giving himself body blows. You know, a boxer, he's, he works on the midriff to kind of soften the guy up uh, before he starts taking head, uh, he starts head hunting. And Paul is using a boxing term, but he's actually, he turns the boxing matches on his opponent, the boxing matches on his, his own body. And he says, I, I discipline my body. I buffet my body. I beat my own body into subjection um, and keep it under control. Lest after, check this out, preaching to others, so sharing the gospel and teaching others how to live a holy life, I myself would be disqualified. In essence, he's saying this. 
even as an apostle and, a, and as a preacher, I take such careful aim at my own life so that after saving your marriage, I don't lose mine. After saving your kids, I don't end up losing mine. After uh, helping you live a holy life that I don't, you know, that I don't live an unholy life. That is what he's saying, that, that I'm very careful in how I go about this. I'm not just running aimlessly. I'm not just, and I think about that. I can still remember when uh, our daughter was, all of our kids had played soccer, but I remember particularly the middle one. And while she was on a soccer field playing, there was this little girl who was on her team that would, would, would play soccer on the soccer field, would play soccer in the field beside the soccer field, just, would just wherever, I mean, wherever daisies and dandelions and the ball would go, that's where the soccer field was. And I think of this aimless running. And he says, I don't, I don't run aimlessly. I don't, I don't box at air. I am taking aim at the right thing to make sure that after I have saved your family, saved your marriage, saved your kids, that I've shared the gospel with you and you've become a Christian, that I myself would not be discarded. And, and that, uh, that phrase, that, that word disqualified, is actually a merchant term. It's the Greek word adokamos. And where it gets its language and its uh, etymology is back in that day, uh, coins would have their value because they were precious metal and how much they weighed. And what would happen is everybody knew this. So when they would get coins that were made out of gold or silver, before they would use them in the market, they would just take some kind of device and just shave a little bit of the gold or the silver off and put it in like a box with all these shavings. And eventually when they got enough shavings, they would take them in, get them melted, and, and uh, turn them in for money. So it was kind of a way of getting a nickel or a dime out of every dollar you spent, right? So you, you, you buy the... You, 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 uh, uh, trade this in for a dollar's worth of product, but you've also shaved off a nickel's worth of, of gold or silver. So what's happened is enough people were doing this that merchants were getting these coins that were so shaved down that they, did, they were not as valuable as they should be. And so what they would do is a lot of merchants would weigh the coin before they would take it. They would accept it. And if it didn't weigh what it was supposed to weigh, they would flick the coin back at the person and say, a dokamas, rejected. I don't want this one. I want a different one. I won't take this one. No sale, no deal. Give me a good coin. And so that's the language. It's a merchant term. Should be disqualified, rejected. So 1 Corinthians 9.27 is the linchpin verse of this whole passage. The coordinating conjunction in verse 10, 1, 4, there's a reason why he says 4. He's connecting what he's about to say in verses 1 through 13 to what he's just said in 9, 27. Literally, he says, I'm going to control myself so that at the end of my Christian life of service, I will not myself be a castaway. And then Paul gives examples and warnings to support what he is about to say here. Um, first thought, God's blessings abounding. So Paul takes us through this journey. And the first journey is he wants, us to he wants to show us the people from the past. We're going to learn from the past. Uh, we have opportunities to learn from our own mistakes, right? And hopefully you do. Like you make a mistake and, uh, and we learn from it. You know anybody who never learns from their own mistakes? Sure you do, right? And you're like, what is wrong with you? you know, how many times are you going to do this <laughs> after this is what's happened? And we just kind of go. But most people learn. They eventually learn from their own mistakes. But what Paul is going to tell us is, I don't want you to just learn from your mistakes. I want you to learn from the mistakes of others. And that takes a little bit more of a maturity, right? To look at someone else and go, Wow. You know, this is what they did, and this is what's going to happen to them. And so he wants them to learn. So the first thing he does is he sets up these Old Testament saints as an example. And in this process, four-part process, the first thing we see is that God's blessings are abounding. Verse 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, when he means fathers, he means our ancestors. 
you know, back generation after generation after generation. So our fathers literally means our people, Israelites, in the past. He's talking about, he's talking to Israelites and he's saying our past ancestors. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our ancestors, our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now stop right there. What he's doing, if this doesn't make sense to you, hopefully it will here in a moment. All these things I just read, Paul intends to show them that those were all blessings that God had poured out on his people. First of all, he gave him his presence They were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. His presence. What what does that mean? What's under the cloud mean? Well, it's his direction. Remember in the Old Testament, there was this Shekinah glory cloud, literally, that led them wherever they were supposed to go. It represented the presence of God. It was a, a, a cloud by day and a what by night? Pillar of fire by night, right? And it it was his it was his presence with them and it gave them direction. And his presence with them also gave them deliverance. They passed through the sea. What is this speaking about? This is referring to the deliverance of, uh, from Egypt by walking through the Red Sea. Supernatural deliverance. So when he mentions these things, he is saying God is, uh, his blessings abounded on our parents, on our ancestors. Like God was so good to them. He gave them his presence. He gave them direction with a glory cloud. He gave them deliverance through the sea. And then, not only God's presence, but God's provision. God's provision. Well, he mentions this. Uh, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Well, what does he talk about here? First of all, God's provision. God gave them godly leadership. uh, A leader who spoke with God, Moses. So that's another thing. They got, they got, this, they got God's provision in having a leader that's, that knew God well and led them well. The second thing is physical sustenance. Remember the Bible spoke about the manna that fell from heaven and like dew on the earth and they could go pick it up in the morning and they could make all kinds of things with it, the manna. And then there was water that came out of the rock at Mount Horeb and at Kadesh on two occasions. They got supernatural water that came, a supernatural miracle where water came from a rock. They got physical, they got physical sustenance, they got godly leadership. In addition, they got spiritual um, assurance. He, he says to them, this rock was, was Christ, like, like Christ inhabited this rock. Really, it wasn't just a rock, but God, God was providing for them through Christ. And, um, and so he mentions all these blessings that God did for them. His presence, God's provision, he gave direction, deliverance, godly leadership, physical sustenance. And not only was it just physical sustenance and water, but, God, but Christ was with them. But then not only that, but then he moves in his, in his example. And now he moves from God's, the, God's blessing abounding to God's people displeasing. God's people displeasing. And then he says this, Nevertheless, verse 5, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown. They were overthrown in the wilderness. And overthrown in the wilderness, that's a.k.a. for, for they were laid low. That's what uh, the, the, the New American Standard actually uses that word, laid low. They, they died. Many of them died. And he begins to give a litany of their sins. I mentioned these and already to you, verse 7 through verse 10. And what he does is he, he kind of kicks around a handful of things, four things. And in essence, I'll make them like a, like a, a command, but he doesn't make them a can, command. But he basically says, do not be an idolater. You see that? Do not be idolaters as some of them were. And then the next thing he says is do not try... Do not try the Lord. Do not try the Lord. And then, in addition to that, he's going to say, um, do not grumble against the Lord, and do not act immoral. So we'll kind of look at these. And with each one of these things, he attaches a story from the past. Exodus chapter 32, Numbers 25, Numbers 21, Numbers 16. Most of them come from stories. And... um, 
in, in Numbers, but also in Exodus of how they did this. So the first one, do not be in idolatry. He says this, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and, and drink and rose up to play. Verse 7. Now what is he referring to there? Most believe, commentators believe, he's referring to Exodus 32. Remember what happens in Exodus 32? Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and the people get tired of waiting. And remember what they say? Moses is dead. We don't know where God is. Aaron, you're in charge. You've got to make us a visible, a visible representation of a God for us because we just, we're kind of lost out here. And so Aaron, um, they want Aaron to make them a golden calf, which was going to represent to them the God that led them out of Egypt. Of course, when what they did was they took all their gold and silver and earrings and jewelry and gave it to Aaron. When Aaron is confronted after this golden calf is made, he said this, the people gave me all their jewelry. I threw it into the fire and out popped this calf. <laughs> First of all, you mean, Aaron, you took a carving tool and you shaped it into a calf. Okay. Isn't that, uh, that, how often do we do that, right? You get, you get two kids, they're in a fight, and what do they say? He hit me first. <laughs> you know, right? Always an excuse. And they worshiped it, and they had a sacred meal, and they sat down for the meal, because it says they sat down, and they stood up to play, sat down, they had a sacred meal. Then they were involved in dancing and and orgies, and they stood up to play, and 3,000 were killed that day. Do not, do not be idolaters. And I know what you're saying. Who in America, who, who, who in American culture, who, who is, what kind of Christian is going to worship some kind of a gold calf or an idol? We don't do that anymore. That's true. We don't. But we have idols. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians that our hearts are idol factories. We can make an idol out of anything. We don't need a golden calf to make an idol out of. We make idols out of everything. You know what an idol is? Anything that stands before your relationship with God. Sometimes newlyweds make idols out of their spouse. New parents can make idols out of their children. We make idols out of our cars Idols out of our houses, idols out of our jobs, idols out of football, idols out of the Ohio State Buckeyes, idols out of the Cleveland Browns. Not most years, but maybe this year, right? <laughs> anything that you treasure, you, you want more than anything that drives your life more than God is an idol. Billy Graham said this, we usually think of an idol as a religious figure carved out of wood or stone, perhaps in some primitive tribe far from removed from civilization. But we have our idols today, he says, because he said, because an idol is anything that you worship in place of the living God. Some people worship the idol of beauty or sexual pleasure. Some people worship the idol of money and security. Some people worship at the shrine of power. He goes on to say, whatever a man seeks honors or exalts more than God. This is the God of his idolatry. The sin of idolatry that plagues the modern world is a me-first attitude, he says, that gives God the leftovers in thought and in life. That was good. John MacArthur said it this way, churches and philosophies have developed that virtually make gods, gods of success, love, social service, self-image, or simply mankind. Anything that takes our first loyalty and allegiance is an idol. Many people who would not take a second glance at a carved idol will sacrifice health, time, family, moral standards, and anything else required in order to achieve the idol of success or recognition that they want. Boy, it's good. Verse 7. Verse 8. He hits another thing that often that, uh, that he wants to be beating out of his own body and wants them to be beating out of theirs. And when I mean body blows, I don't mean he's literally taking body blows, but he means I'm putting things in place. I'm very careful about these things because I don't want to be displeasing to the Lord. And so the second thing he says is do not act immorally. Verse 8. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did in 20. 
3,000 fell in a single in a single day. So here we've got to think about Numbers 25. So you can write that down and you could look over that story later. Do not act immorally. And he's speaking about sexual immorality in particular. And sexual immorality, if you're not sure what that is, is sex outside of marriage or any sexual immoral, immoral activity outside of the confines and boundaries of, of marriage. In Numbers 25, it tells of a story, a reference, it's a reference to Baal of Peor worship with the Moabites. And what happened is the Israelites, 23,000 Israelites, shared a sacrificial meal with them, if you read the story, and then worshiped their God and engaged in the fertility rites of Baal with acts of sexual immorality uh, with with Moabite prostitutes. So what would happen is in the Moabite culture, they would, have, uh, they would have temples to Baal and they would have temple prostitutes. And part of your act of worship to your God, Baal, would be to have sex with a temple prostitute. And some of the Israelites said, let's become culturally relevant. Let's, let's kind of sample, you know, the religions around us. Let's go... Let's go see what it's like. And, and they did. And um, the result is, is that 23,000 died. God had divine wrath upon them. And 23,000 fell in a single day. When it means fell, you know what that means, right? God killed them. He goes on. He's not done. That's I said, this is tough. But we're going to get to some encouraging parts here in a moment. Um, we must not put Christ to the test, verse 9. So the third thing is, do not try the Lord. Do not test the Lord. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. So this is the whole serpent on the, on the pole. Remember the story, the serpent, look and live? That's Numbers 21. So they were tired of the manna. So, so they said, we, we don't have nothing to eat, Moses. You brought us out here to kill us. What's God doing? So Moses talks to God, and God says, tell the people to go out in the morning. They're going to find, like, man is going to fall from the sky. They're going to gather it up. It's going to be like, they're going to use it to make bread and all kinds of things. Well, and at first they're like, oh, my word. And you know what manna, you know what manna means in its original language? It means what is it? <laughs> they hadn't seen anything like this. It was like a coriander seed that was a little sweet. Almost tasted like a little bit of honey. And at first they loved it, and it was just in love with, with manna. But eventually, after eating the same thing, right? If you ever do that, eat the same thing for breakfast every day for years, you kind of got tired of it. And they wanted more than water. And they were complaining and grumbling against God and Moses. And the Bible says, Numbers 21, that fiery serpents... Um, came out and bit them, and many of them died. Of course, God had a, a remedy for those who would look and live the serpent on a pole. John MacArthur says this, They wanted more variety, more spice. They complained and complained and questioning God's goodness and tried his patience. They had no concern for pleasing God, only for his, him pleasing, pleasing them. So, do not put the Lord to the test. And the last thing he mentions after that is verse 10, Nor grumble as some of those did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And this takes us to number 16. So there was, a, there was an uprisal, a rebellion, by a dude named Korah and a host of people. And they said, Moses, you're stupid. You are a bad leader. I'm in charge now. And so God took care of Korah and the others for their rebellion. But then what happened is a lot of the people got mad about this. They, got, they began to grumble, and they blamed Moses for everyone's death. They said, it's your fault. Like, if you wouldn't have been so stupid and doing what you did, Korah wouldn't, and all these people wouldn't be, be dead. And then a plague came and kills 14,700, number 16, all because they were grumbling. I always like to pull that verse out to my kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> they grumbled. And then, um, and then so, so we see God's discipline. Third point, God's discipline. God's discipline. 
Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. Therefore let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he, lest he fall. So we see all, throughout all this, so not only did we see that uh, God was displeased with them, but we saw discipline. And here's the thing you have to understand. Um, God doesn't get angry like we get angry. Have you ever like, uh, <laughs> how do I say this? Okay, let, let me say it this way. Uh, one time our son said to us, why do, you, why do you, when I was little, did you send us to my room and then you like waited a few minutes? Or sometimes a different parent would come to me. Well, first of all, that gave him time to put on four pairs of underwear and three pairs of jeans, right? Uh, there have been times where I just see this kid just kind of like, you know, who is uh, taking that time to try to pat himself a little bit before he's spanking when he was little. This is our oldest who just turned 21 uh, a few days ago. And uh, his mom told him one time, well, it's because if we're ever so mad at you that we wanted to spank you, kept you in a room until we didn't want to anymore, or we sent the other parent, right? Sometimes when we think about getting mad, we think of this person out of control. Ah, you know, he, he, they're about to blow, everybody run, you know? And we know people like that, right? Like when their anger, anger, when their anger happens, it's, well, when God is angry, God's anger is not like some, some lunatic out of control. It is a, a purposeful emotion under a controlled emotion, a, a, a purposeful position toward what has happened. Does that make sense? His anger, God's anger is different than ours. When we think of our anger, it's just this raging emotion that can show itself in all kinds of ways. We're all, everybody's running for cover type of thing. With God, it's not like that. It's a, it's a purposeful decision. It's a purposeful position against something that is, that is wrong. And in God's anger... He, he disciplines his people. And we see all these ways that he's disciplined. But what Paul is doing is he's using this as, an, as a warning. He wants this to be a warning to us. So our fourth point is God's warning. So four points. God's blessing abounding. God's people displeasing. God's discipline, as we've been looking. And then God's, God's warning. They were examples by which we are to learn from and to be deterred from. Verse 6 and verse 11. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Then look in verse 11. He says it again in a different way. Now these things happened to them as examples, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. What Paul is saying is, I'm, he's saying this, I'm reminding these, these, these examples to you, Corinthians, so that you see... The, the sinfulness that can happen to people who have been blessed by God, who, have, who God has pulled into covenant. If, if they're not careful, if they're not, if they're not guarding themselves and beating their body into subjection, if they're not carefully watching what's going on, they can fall into the kind of things that these Israelites did. Uh, they, can, they can be an idolater. They can begin to love something more than God. They can act immorally. I, I just I think about so often that a, a lot of times, um, you know, godly uh, singles don't make it their aim to go out and be immoral. It's just that they have not made uh, stands that they're going to take uh, with uh, uh, in in uh, uh, stands they're going to take and positions they're going to take and guards in their life uh, that they're going to take. And so he's saying, think about these things ahead of time. Don't test the Lord. Don't grumble. And then he gives us these two powerful verses that I think are very encouraging. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Right there. How many times have you said or heard someone say, well, I'd never do that. Not in a million years would I be caught doing what they did. You know what? That is a dangerous thing to say. It really is. You know, I, I've, I've, had, I've had men who are doing really well in areas of purity and holiness and say, I'd, I'd never, I would never get caught up in that porn. I'd never get caught up cheating on my wife. And I said, and I said that's a dangerous position to hold. Like, don't ever say that. I mean, always be on guard. Always be, um, be, be cautious 
about the time you say you never will. So a lot of times that's the position. We just have this arrogance. We have this high esteem of, 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 of who we are. You know, it's, uh, and, and the truth is, is, um, is we, are, we are all susceptible. We are all susceptible to lying, to cheating, to, to uh, saying things that are unkind and, and hateful. And so the first thing he says here is anyone who thinks he stands. What's he saying there? You think you're beyond all this? Oh, Paul, you no, know, you didn't need to tell us about that. You didn't need to tell me about that. I mean, I, you think I'm going to... You think I'm going to cheat on my spouse? You think I'm going to act immoral? You think I'm going to love something more than God? You think I'm going to grumble and complain? <laughs> well, I know we can. So I've been a pastor for 27 years, and I've heard it, right? <laughs> That's what he says. He says it this way. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Like, don't be arrogant. Don't say it won't happen to you. By the grace of God, it won't. If you're guarding your life and you're putting protection in and you've you got accountability partners. Now, I'm, I know I talk about accountability partners, but I haven't for a while. So let me just say this. Accountability partners are a wonderful thing. You've got to be careful with them. But I, I would not think about not, about not having an accountability partner. It's at least one person in your life who knows your greatest weaknesses. And has permission to ask you about them all the time. And not just someone who has the right to ask you about them, but has, someone has the right to punch you in the face when you need it. You need at least one person in your life like that. And if you say, I don't know, yeah, really. Like, I have always had someone in my life, an accountability partner, who can ask me anything. Anything is on the table. Anything is on the table. And more than just meetings with accountability partners, someone who has the kind of relationship that they need to, they can punch you in the face if you need it. And so, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And then he says this, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. So if for the person who is like now defeated, like, oh my goodness, he says this, there's grace. There's grace in the Lord. There's power in the Lord. There's power in the Holy Spirit. Like, there's a way out. God has saved you by the blood of his son. And not only did Jesus defeat the penalty of sin, but he defeated the power of sin. So you no longer have to have allegiance to your own sinful desires and Satan. Does that, does that make sense? Like, no temptation has overtaken you that such is as common to man but God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to to in to endure it so he gives warnings in essence he tells us to control evil cravings cast aside overconfidence and then cast aside despair so really from from verse 5 through 11, we're told to control our cravings. Um, and then in verse 12, cast aside overconfidence, right? You who, who, uh, who think you stand, who think you're beyond all this, hey, you watch out lest you fall. So he talks about controlling evil cravings for the biggest part of it. He talks about casting away aside overconfidence and then in verse 13 casting aside despair now what, what do i mean by that well have you ever have you ever sinned hope i know you've sinned so that's not the question have you ever sinned and then as the result of your sin you felt so guilty but instead of guilt being godly guilt that drives you to repentance and confession, that it was, it was not a godly guilt, but a godless guilt that literally used, wheeled in the hand of your own flesh or Satan, caused you to despair. Is that, you hear what I'm saying here? Like sometimes guilt is a good thing because it drives me to Christ. It drives me to repentance and forgiveness. And you know, I, run, I run to God and forgiveness. But sometimes wielded by Satan or my flesh, 
Guilt can be used to make me run away from the source of healing and, and cause me to despair. And so, verse 13, cast aside despair. And, this, and despair of sinning and despair of thinking, I can never conquer this. Have you ever had some stronghold in your life? And all God's people said amen, right? Stronghold is just a sin that consistently kicks your tail and has for years. Like, you have a susceptibility to a certain thing that maybe I don't. Now, the problem is, is we all give excuses for, for our strongholds and then judge everybody else's strongholds greatly, right? But we all have this susceptibility, this propensity, this propensity to sin. In a, we sin in all kinds of ways, but a particular way. And a lot of times it's different than someone else's. And, um, and a lot of times we can fall into despair and think that there's no way that we're going to be able to get victory over this. But I love what he says. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Well, I'm different. You, you, I'm a monster. You're not going to believe what I... Yeah, there's no sin, there's no temptation that's not common to men. There are people out there. God is faithful who will not let you be tempted beyond our ability, but with the temptation, he'll provide a way to escape that you may be able to endure it. Cast aside despair. Nothing you face is new to mankind. Well, you don't know, you have no idea what kinds of things I have to deal with in life. People face similar things all the time. And the other thing is, and even in the midst of that, God is faithful. Yeah, God is faithful. God will not let you be tempted, tested, trialed <laughs> beyond what you can handle in his strength and grace. I mean, you can't handle nothing on your own, right? Remember what uh, Jesus says in John 15? Without me, you can do nothing of spiritual significance. So there's a lot of things that are beyond our power that we can't handle on our own strength, but handle in his strength, in his grace, in his power. God will provide a way to escape. What's that look like? I don't know exactly how it looks like, but he promises it. With God's help, you can endure any temptation or any trial. Here's what people don't know. The word trial and temptation in the Bible are the exact same word. Sometimes it's translated trial. Sometimes it's translated testing. Sometimes it's translated temptation. They're not three different words. It's one year word, and de depending on the context of the situation, the, the writers interpret that to be temptation or trial or testing where it seems appropriate. But it's the same word, and I've always said this. Every trial can be a temptation, and every temptation is a trial. And God will get us through. Now, he writes this to be sobering, at the same time, he says this to be encouraging. You know, just because you went to the magical part of the room and you prayed a prayer to the Lord and asked him to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from your unrighteousness and to uh, you accepted Christ into your life. Sometimes the way that people have, have sold you the gospel, they've said things like, do you, do you want to be rich? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to have no more trials in life? Then pray this prayer. Well, that's never, ever the way the, the, the Bible portrays the gospel. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, your problems don't all go away. Now, you have the power of the Holy Spirit and you have God as your Father that'll get you through anything. But life is just not a Fruit Loop and applesauce day every day once you trust Christ as your Savior. And all of your desire to sin does not go away all at once. We have to, what's he say? Beat my buffet discipline my body and make it a slave and why does he say that he says that because our 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 urges and our appetites want to control the rest of us right how many times have you ever known a friend that just is out of, out of control just always always is driven by their emotion and desire right what they think comes out their mouth. What they want to do, they do. But and you ask them later, well, how'd you do that? I don't know. <laughs> don't be like that. Don't be like that. You have the power of God in your life to overcome your, your, your desires, your appetites. Father, thank you for the power that comes through you. That will help us live holy lives. Thank you for the warnings, terrible, terrible warnings that Paul gave us this morning of ways that people who are in 
who are in covenant and relationship with you would sin against you and then and would experience um, your discipline. Help us to walk in holiness and obedience before you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.